Henry VIII was a man renowned for his tyrannical ways and has been accused of murder on more than one occasion. His dismantling of the Pilgrimage of Grace, along with his slain of so-called innocents, still resonates to this day. But could the same accusation be laid at his feet on the death of his queen, Anne Boleyn? The answer is no. He would always manage to make an exception to the law, and as it stood back in the day, Anne Boleyn's execution was well within the remit. Over the years, much has been speculated about Henry, all without a shred of clarity that what he did was correct. He's been described as a grotesque failure, a wife murderer and more. But his crowning moment of absurdity came when he decided to remove his queen, the one woman he had stalked for six years, telling her of his undying love. And yet what seems to be a case of idle gossip soon proved to be a pivotal point in his reign. Anne Boleyn was said to have been killed simply because the king hated her. It's quite an unbelievable statement and often oversimplified. In this story, we're going to explore the reasons, the predators and the supporters who possibly feared a similar outcome and so held their silence. According to the law as previously stated, Henry, Thomas Cromwell and other hierarchy members either contrived or conspired to murder this lady. It's seen as no more than a gang of men taking this woman to her grave in ways in which it is difficult to comprehend. At her trial, the whole of the Privy Council, two grand juries and 26 peers sat in judgment. Adding to this the judges, parliament and the king, it's a terrifying case of mob rule. The public was also invited to watch the sham unravel. But luckily for historians today, records were kept and we can now take a closer look at the revealing accusations and accountability these men had in coming to their decision. Depositions are missing from the records and as we all know, there has to be two sides to every story. But the Tudors were famed for their fake news and rewrote much of history in a way that sues rather than a way that gives actual evidence. They would have looked upon such destructive material as dangerous to the monarchy if it got into the hands of the wrong people. So issues covered were written in a way as to spread the blame, take no accountability for their actions. Cromwell stated that some of the accusations were so abominable they did not bear to be brought up in court. Again, the wording is interesting it would not have laid any blame on the king, but this is another telling comment, yet one that we cannot consider as no reports exist. It certainly doesn't help when trying to piece together Anne's final days. The ferocity and speed from arrest to condemnation lacks the consistency required to understand the whole story fully. Also, no evidence exists as to Henry VIII believing his wife. It has been thought that maybe Henry deceived himself into taking action a deluded man who believed everything was against him, whether true or not. The events of 1536 are without doubt a pivotal year for the king, who was undoubtedly culpable and immoral, and now described as a puppet with no strings to pull, although there are people who insist the name calling and conspiracy to murder claims are far from the truth. Henry was always a man who took comment at face value, Yet on this occasion, so upset was he by the news coming from within, he ordered a full inquiry into the event, telling his counsellors that such unscrupulous details had and must be investigated before further word can transpire. This brings us an interesting question. Why did Anne displease Henry so much that he would have her executed? And why did he not place the same treatment on his previous wife, Catherine of Aragon? His life would have been so much easier without Catherine around, yet Catherine had strong allies abroad, and perhaps Henry thought twice about such actions, as war was not a credible reason to risk all. Life may well have been less complicated, but the power of numbers was against him, whereas Anne only had herself to protect. You could say she was an easy target, Catherine could well have been brought forward for treasonable actions, even though she stated insistently that the king was her husband and sovereign lord. 
So we now see a different viewpoint in which possibly Henry understood the precarious position now had with Anne and made every effort to glean convincing evidence. Thomas Cromwell is another man who fought tooth and nail to climb the ladder. He was certainly a yes man, still one who has been described as hideously corrupt. Cromwell saw his duty in this case never at one with the Queen. It was his opportunity in his eyes to remove a malignant growth from society. Today, many still do not believe that Anne had charges lawfully put against her. We can assume that many believe she is innocent and even beyond reproach. Yet it was a completely different consensus of opinion at the time, one in which all who were told the story believed without any doubt. Had Elizabeth Anne's daughter never become the monarch, it may well have been left to the modern day historian to attempt to piece together the scripts used in a way of helping rehabilitate Anne's reputation. She was framed and Anne, who stood alone in the dock, had no chance of persuading her peers otherwise. Even Chapuis, the Spanish ambassador, had the same thoughts. Anne was a victim, a political coup that went badly wrong, yet one of ruthless inventiveness. Henry almost admitted to Jane Seymour that his previous wife had died for meddling too much in state affairs. Let's now look at what we have, an assessment of the Queen, which remembers and only pertains to the evidential records we still have today. Anne only had her words to describe her accounts of what happened, the compromising conversations, the lurid behaviour, the unwittingly generous privileges she gave to others, but all would come back to haunt the Queen. The real power battle was not with the King, but one between Anne and Cromwell. Chapuis would often comment on the plot to bring her down with false accusations and in particular on charge of attempting to kill the king. Any substantial evidence is lacking. The court gave no reason for her said extramarital affairs that allegedly took place over the three years of her marriage. Nothing was given in the way of proof of any infidelity. The absence of such statements including many discrepancies only fuels the interest suggesting that the four men accused alongside her were convicted and executed in a bigger picture to prove her guilt. In contrast and in reality, this would only and should have only prejudiced her trial. Yet these documents are also nowhere to be found, so the assumption is all that we have. To the very end, Anne denied all charges. Some people at the time were said to have raised suspicion on the whole event. It didn't make any sense regardless of how some perceived her. The real question is why did Anne die? What did she do so wrong that brought about her downfall? In summary, the case against Anne, for an historian, is to believe what you see. Attempt a conclusion from the records. Anne, in most eyes, was the victim of a dreadful miscarriage of justice, alongside the men who also stood trial for their numerous offences. It would be a soul-destroying time for many involved, including the King, who may have also felt some remorse. But as we have said, he could only go on what he was being told. Quite possibly, the saddest reflection of all comes from Elizabeth, who would bear the scars of this terrible period throughout the rest of her life. With no proof in existence as to what caused this trial to take place, it must be presumed based purely on the doubtful evidence that Anne Boleyn went to her death as an innocent woman. Legends and myths are renowned in history and stories change with the sands of time. In this case of Anne Boleyn, it was claimed her body was removed from the Tower of London and reburied near to Blickling Hall, her birthplace. However, this was discarded when the so-called grave was entered years later and no remains were found. It is just one of many myths that have appeared over the years. Some other interesting stories also come to light one in which Anne's heart was stolen and placed in a church near Thetford in Norfolk. It was kept in a tin box and placed in the chancel wall before being buried under the organ. Although again another unlikely yarn, as heart burials had gone entirely out of fashion by the 14th century. And so we venture back to the Tower of London and the small church that resides on the property, St Peter ad Vincula. Anne, along with many others, was buried here. Mutterings of tombs being opened in the reign of Elizabeth 
also hold no reliable evidence. The bodies that have been found were initially buried simply under a chancel pavement. So who can we find here? The coffin of the Duke of Northumberland rests by the side of the Duke of Somerset. Both these men are between the Queen's Anne Boleyn, Catherine Howard. Also discovered was the coffin of Lady Jane Grey, Thomas Seymour, Lady Rochford and Anne's brother, George Boleyn. In 1876, Queen Victoria allowed the restoration of the now ruinous state of the Royal Chapel. It was agreed, but only upon the complete reverence such a task must take and that records must be kept to mark the identification of any remains found. Work began in November of that year. It was a revealing sight and many of the bodies had remained unmoved in over three centuries. At first sight, the excavation committee found it difficult to ascertain which bones belonged to who, although they did know that the spot they were digging was the actual place of Tudor internments. Attempts were made to clarify the bodies. In the case of Anne Boleyn, it said a heap of bones were found, carefully arranged only two feet below the chancel floor. Again, this is quite contentious. In 1750, a lady by the name of Hannah Beresford buried in the same area. When found, her remains were two feet lower than the resting place of Anne, suggesting the array of bones found had been disturbed at some point. The bones said to be of Anne were examined upon removal. The results of the inquiry showed they were the bones of a young girl aged between 25 to 30. Delicate body frame of slender proportions, the forehead and lower jaw in remarkable condition. Upon further analysis, the committee concluded this must be Anne, due to her tiny neck. Further disclosure stated the skull was round, had a prominent forehead, a straight orbital ridge, large eyes, oval face with a full chin. The hands and feet offer more clues, saying these were both delicate, well shaped. The woman's height was adjudged to be around 5 feet 3 inches. The final adjudication was given that all the bones belonged to the same person. In conclusion, it was in their opinion that the remains found were consistent with the descriptions given of Anne Boleyn and could well be the same person painted by Holbein. The paintings of Anne we see today are all with her portrayed with a pointed chin, yet this evidence points to the body having a square chin and we know that no artwork remains of Anne painted by Holbein. There is though an 18th century representation of a Holbein work a sketch of a lady who was not discovered or said to be a representation of Anne until 1649. The height of Anne is also questionable. Nicholas Sander wrote 50 years after her death, she was rather tall of stature. But this sounds a little suspect as a Venetian diplomat of the time said Anne was of middling height. Again, reports of her having a long neck were dispelled as the one found under the chancel was short. To add to the overall mystery, a further four other decapitated females have been found at the chapel. Add to the three we already mentioned, you'll also find that of Margaret Pole, the Countess of Salisbury. This begs the question of what did they actually see? Was it Anne, or quite possibly Catherine Howard? The square jaw described is more leaning to her, based on the miniature drawing of Holbein. Another interesting aspect of identifying the graves was that close to the Duke of Northumberland, and the place suggested Catherine Howard lay, her remains were not found, implying that the bones had dissolved in the quicklime found within the earth over time. The solution would undoubtedly decompose any remains to dust over that period. In the 18th century, it has been revealed two other women had been moved into the area to make way for further burials. One thought to be that of Margaret Pole, who had been executed when she was 67 years old in 1541. Based upon their detective work, the other remains probably belonged to a woman in her 40s, one of a larger frame than Catherine, as Catherine was no more than a child at her death. So were these the bones of Anne Boleyn, whose death had been established at the age of 35? These findings would now pose more questions. Two Dukes of Northumberland and Somerset lay between the two queens. However, the committee thought that the position of the bodies was opposite to what was initially thought. In 1877, all the skeletal remains, excluding George Boleyn, Thomas Seymour and Lady Jane Grey, were laid to rest again, this time in a leaden coffin screwed down with copper screws and placed inside an outer coffin made of oak. 
Each bore a plaque with the name and arms of the person. All were buried just four inches below the pavement. The floor was then covered in concrete and laid with the decorative tiles you can still see to this day. All the remains were left in the position found. The same thing happened with both bodies on the outer, divided by the dukes in the chancel. The flooring within the area doesn't correspond to the memorial plates laid. A space was left beneath where it's thought Catherine Howard had been placed. Another curious aspect of this is that some bones had been mistakenly identified in 1876, thought to be Anne Boleyn, but now considered be Lady Rochford. There now remains a further mystery as to whether the body of Anne Boleyn actually lays under the slab marked Rochford. Anne Boleyn might well have died an ignominious death. Still, her legend lives on. Her daughter would go on to become one of the greatest monarchs England has ever seen. A child who grew up hardly uttering a mother in any sentence and close to following the same ordeals. Elizabeth was imprisoned at the tower for a while and she stayed there prior to her coronation, but that was the last time she visited the building. When Elizabeth arrived at the tower in 1559, she announced to the expectant crowds, some have fallen from being princes of this land to be prisoners in this place. I am raised from being a prisoner in this place to be a prince of this land. This was Anne Boleyn's greatest legacy, a daughter who not only went on to control the country for the next 45 years, but had Anne lived, without a doubt she would have glorified and proclaimed her daughter's achievements for the rest of her days. Many years ago, a girl was born so insignificant that nobody recorded her date of birth, yet she would become one of the most famous queens of British history. Her experiences through life were all doomed. She became a leading actress in this melodramatic conspiracy, and a story if told today, some would say it could only be created in fiction. Well, left with so much undiscovered, it's quite probable her story will never be fully known. But the love people still have for this lady won't be quelled for some time to come. <laughs>